The climate crisis is the single greatest threat to life as we know it. As we continue to burn fossil fuels and our planet heats up, storms are getting more intense. Sea levels are rising. Wildfire season is growing. And energy-related economic and political chaos is spreading. And while the age of outright climate denial may be coming to an end, we don't all agree on how or how quickly to combat the crisis. Welcome to the Climate Debates from Rolling Stone. Hi, and welcome to another installment of Rolling Stone's Climate Debates. Today, we're going to debate a technology called carbon removal. The basic idea of carbon removal is simple. It's about building big machines that can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. One way to think about them is as artificial trees. You do the same thing that trees do, except on a massive industrial scale. Advocates like Elon Musk, who just offered a $100 million prize for technology that can pull CO2 out of the air, and big oil companies and gas companies see this kind of technology as a necessary solution to the climate crisis. Climate activists, environmental activists, and others see it as just another kind of techno fix. It's expensive, it's dangerous, and it's just going to put off the most important job that we have, which is to end the use of fossil fuels entirely. Here to talk about this today is Elizabeth Yampierre, climate warrior extraordinaire, co-chair of the mm -hmm. Climate Justice Alliance and the executive director of UPROSE, Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization, and Dr. Julio Friedman, a senior research scholar at the Center for Global Energy at Columbia University. During the Obama administration, he worked for the Office of Fossil Fuel Energy at the Department of Energy, where he was responsible for the Department of Energy's research and development program in advanced fossil energy systems, carbon capture and storage, and clean coal deployment. We're going to break this conversation up into three sections. The first is about the basics of carbon removal, what it is and how it works. The second section will be about the politics of this technology, what it means for how we think about the climate crisis. And the last section will be about climate justice and who has the most to gain and the most to lose from the deployment of this technology. And then at the end, we're gonna wrap it up with a short little five minutes of just quick question and answers uh, on this. So let's get started. Thank you both for being here. I'm very happy to have you here. This is gonna be a, a fascinating discussion. I'm really interested in this technology. I've been thinking about it and writing about it for um, a decade uh, since the old uh, future gen coal uh, plant was proposed way back when in the early days. Hodi, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I think for our viewers, that would you just um, explain very simply what carbon removal is and how it works? Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Elizabeth. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, it's helpful to put this in the three different words, in the context of these words, avoided, reduced, removed. Avoided emissions are not emitting something. So not chopping down a forest or not building a coal plant, that's avoided emissions. Reduced emissions are taking from a baseline and dropping it. So building a solar uh, PV plant doesn't necessarily reduce emissions, but if you replace a gas plant with a solar plant, then that does reduce emissions, okay? Efficiency reduces emissions, conservation reduces emissions. Also, if you capture CO2 at the back end of something like a steel mill, that will also reduce emissions. Removed is something totally different. Here, the CO2 is already in the air and oceans. There's basically a handful of things you can do to pull CO2 out of the air and oceans. One of those we're pretty familiar with, trees. Trees do that. But there's also a need to build and deploy things that can do it bigger and faster at a huge scale. And there are, again, different ways of doing this. But one way is something called direct air capture, which basically filters CO2 out of the air. Uh, you can also use certain kinds of rocks and minerals to mineralize CO2 at the Earth's surface. Uh, you can also do something like take a biomass plant, say municipal solid waste, but instead of just making hydrogen or energy out of it, capturing that CO2 and removing it as well. So Elizabeth, uh, why is this important to be talking about now? Why is this on your radar? You're obviously not someone who's um, thinking about this sort of deep technology and science of this. You're looking at this from a completely different perspective. Why is carbon removal on your radar right now? Well, Jeff, thank you for inviting me and Julio, good to meet you. I think that uh, the science of 
and technology is on our radar. And it's on our radar because we are working at the intersection of racial injustice and climate change. And so frontline communities are always looking for solutions. We've done everything from past legislation to operationalize a just transition and put down infrastructure on the ground that will reduce emissions and provide us with wealth, with community wealth. Um, so we're constantly thinking about solutions. Um, so it is important to us. And, um, and I know that, that Julio mentioned three words. He used three words to talk about um, how he was going to describe it. And, and I, I'd like to use three too. I'd like to say that the technology is unproven, ineffective and inefficient. Um, you know, when we're talking about direct air capture, we're talking about an enormous, enormous energy consumption. Uh, the huge land area that is required to operate at scale of renewables of power. And even the emissions are sort of, you know, what we call in the climate justice movement for solutions. And we know that these U.S. subsidies now can increase the amount of carbon, um, the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, for CCS, which is what Julio is talking about, it emits 1.4 to 4.7 tons of CO2 for each ton removed. And for the DAC, uh, it emits 1.5 to 3.4 tons of CO2 for each ton removed. So, so these are technologies that, um, that will have a disparate impact on communities of color and low income communities and communities with a legacy of environmental racism that are the ones that are uh, the ones who have ha gotten COVID and have gotten sick as a result of living in the midst of environmental burdens for generations. Uh, so this is an issue that is tremendously important to us. So just to clarify one thing as we go forward, uh, you use the acronyms DAC, and for, for those who, who, who are, have not part of this larger conversation, direct, that stands for direct air capture, which are basically standalone machines. Mm -hmm. Basically, you can think of them as artificial trees, which pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, there are a number of startup companies that are involved in this. It's certainly a, a technology that a lot, there's a lot of investment in right now. And then the other acronym that Elizabeth used, that I think Julio used briefly also, is CCS, which stands for Carbon Capture and Storage, which is basically um, ways of pulling CO2 out of power plants for, for all intents and purposes or industrial facilities. So there are two different technologies that we're talking about here today, and and it's just important at the outset to be clear about that. So Julia, I, I want to ask you, you can follow up with however you'd like, but I would like to ask you one thing that stuck out to me is, is Elizabeth, Elizabeth called this technology unproven. How, how, how would you, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, I couldn't disagree more strongly with her three words and the way that she used them. Let me add that those three words were used to describe lithium ion batteries and solar panels 20 years ago exactly those kinds of framings. And we learned stuff and we got better uh, and we built things at scale. Uh, I also disagree with her numbers. The numbers she used are not the numbers that the National Academy, the IPCC, or the Royal Society have come across. I don't know which numbers she's citing or what they're based on, but it is in fact the case that if you operate a direct air capture facility using zero carbon electricity and heat, that you get basically uh, one ton of removal for every 1.1 ton of capture, that's basically 90% efficient and effective. And the land use issues for a DAC plant are tiny. One plant does the work of 36,000 trees with the footprint of one tree. The energy footprints are different. And if you use solar or offshore wind, there would be a large land footprint. But again, that is a, a function of how you design it and operate it that's not intrinsic to the technology. With respect to being untested, I mean, we've been pulling CO2 out of the air and ocean since 1930. And we know that because there's a scene in Apollo 13 in which they talk about fixing the direct air capture system uh, in the space module. Um, we already have three companies that will sell you a unit with a performance guarantee and a wrapper. And they're pulling thousands of tons of CO2 out of the air and oceans today, and they're storing it in rock in Iceland forever. Um, that I, I want to say one last thing that I think is at the heart of this discussion. Direct air capture, CO2 removal, these are not substitutes for reduction. In no way, shape, or form. We must reduce as much emissions as we can as quickly as we can, and we should use everything that we can to do it. It is also the case that we have about 10 billion tons of greenhouse gases that we have no idea how to remove or reduce, right. where we just don't have a solution. Again, that's the IPCC, 
that's uh, the National Academies. This is not me talking. We need to get to zero. We need this direct air capture and carbon removal as well. Julio, just just like you are a scientist uh, that you're a scientist that works for fossil fuel companies. Um, so you know, I I, I I challenge whether or not you're objective in your assessment. So there sorry, are lots of, there, if I there, interrupt there, that. There, there, no, there are lots of no. scientists who will take a very different uh, position. Yeah. Uh, I work for President and, Obama. And, and what you present, I work for President Obama. And, and Obama I don't think I'm a like, fossil fuel head. And just like Obama and Biden, Biden is also uh, pushing for solutions and doubling down on things like green hydrogen and, uh, and carbon capture and things that we think can put our communities in harm's way. Um, so regardless of whether it's Obama or Biden, we're going to have to challenge you on that because the truth is that the science is telling us that uh, that we have to be able to move beyond what this does. And with this, this is another form of extraction. This is a false solution and it's a techno fix. And so um, we can we can argue about numbers, but we're talking about technologies that are fossil fuel subsidies that allow for business as usual scenario that allows for a continuation of the dig, dump, and burn economy that will prevent us, uh, that will not prevent breaching the 1.5 Celsius threshold or, redu or reduce or eliminate emissions at source. Instead, what you might want to consider is looking at the 4 per 1,000 initiative so that we're looking at natural solutions and not industrial solutions. You know, it's an initiative initiative uh, that was launched by France uh, at COP21, and it aims to, to demonstrate that agriculture, and in particular, agricultural soils can play a crucial role where food security and climate change are concerned. And it's also supported by solid scientific documentation. Um, and this initiative invites all partners to stay and implement some practical actions on soil carbon storage and the types of practices that achieve this, like agroecology, agroforestry, conservation, agriculture, landscape management. So those are alternatives, and we would never reject a solution without looking at what the healthier and more sustainable alternative is that honors people and the planet. So nobody's talking about rejecting any solution but you. We are totally in favor of soil and carbon. Like, we, like I'm a huge fan of carbon in soils. We've, we've released 500 billion tons of carbon from the soil. It needs to go back in, right? I'm totally in favor of planting more trees and not deforesting either, but it can't get there. The volumes are simply not big enough. 10 billion tons is the number. Nature-based solutions can get us one. One of those 10. How do you get the other nine? By the there way, we're on the clock. We have to get to zero just as quickly as possible. Okay. I am not prepared to put anything off the table that can do the job. And I last point, and then I'll happily cede to you, pulling CO2 out of the air and oceans as a legacy of pollution management is not business as usual. It's the opposite of business as usual. So it's funny. actually taking stewardship for what you've done. You're hilarious. You know, you're, you're working with BP, with ExxonMobil, with ConocoPhillips, and you're telling me it's not business as usual. I'm talking about the fact that people in our communities are disparately impacted by decisions that are being made without us at the table. And we know that there are risks. There are underground storage risks like leakage, blowouts, earthquakes, groundwater contamination. Just a few months ago uh, in Mississippi and Yazoo County, uh, there was a pipe that ruptured containing carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. Um, and when the Department of Environmental Quality tested air quality on the site, they found CO2. It resulted in evacuation of 300 residents and 45 people were sent to two hospitals. You know, it's great that you are incorporating or thinking about natural solutions, but we're saying that these tech fixes, these fossil, these uh, false solutions are not going to solve this massive problem, that it has to be done differently. It really is an industry that has been uh, created to support the oil industry and other kinds of businesses that benefit from this, but it, they don't benefit people and they certainly don't benefit the planet. You compared this to lithium batteries and, and other technology, and I, I want to push back on that. I mean, this is not that simple. You know, I mean, I know lithium batteries aren't simple, but we're talking about an enormously complex engineering program here. Not so much the science so hard, I don't think, but the engineering aspects of this. I mean, I, I don't think that analogy is, to my understanding, fair to the challenges that we face with this. If you're just talking about batteries as a block of chemicals, I think that's fair. 
But then the comparison would be with the direct air capture, which is a box that with a fan, you know. But the deployment of lithium ion batteries in things like automobiles on the grid as a balancing authority, as a way to store renewables and dispatch it, that is immensely complicated. That's got the same issues going through the FERC, through utility commissions. Is it a load or is it a source? The manufacturing and supply chains are now global, and that has its own environmental consequences with it, say in the deforestation of the Congo to get cobalt for anodes. Like there's all kinds of stuff. As we scale these things up, it is a lot more complicated. But 20 years ago, people used lithium ion batteries for one and only one thing, video camcorders. Right. right. <laughs> that was it. Right. Right. But and but, so, the, and, and they were at the time called way too expensive, really inefficient, too small to scale, a dead end, a techno fix. It was called all those same things. And I don't think that it's fair to take something that we know could do a useful purpose and box it out today based on where we're at. But just to follow up, last question on the last thing on this, just to follow this up is, you know, a few years ago, Vaclav Smil, a well-known expert in energy, mm -hmm. Canadian expert, talked about the scale of industrialization that is required for carbon capture. And he, and he I don't know if I have these numbers exactly right, but I think they're basically right, that to sequester and bury half of the CO2 that comes out of power plants would require an industrial infrastructure twice the size of the current oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an enormous, enormous, enormous mm -hmm. project. So what we know how to do today in terms of reducing emissions is we know how to get rid of about 35 gigatons without carbon capture, okay? We know how to get rid of about five gigatons capturing on stuff that's really tough, like cement plants and steel mills, okay? In the U.S., I do not believe we're going to use carbon capture on a lot of coal plants. So I just don't think that's good. Those are going to shut down and be replaced with something else, okay? But he is exactly right on the volumes. The world's oil and gas industry today moves about 5 billion tons of stuff. We're talking about removing about 10 billion tons of stuff. But that's the arithmetic. He's right in terms of the numbers, and it's just that hard, but we don't get to zero without it. Because zero is hard. We can get to 80% drop without it, but we can't get to zero. So let's move on to the second section about politics. Uh, and I think you know this is also a really important uh, aspect of this conversation beyond the, just the technology. And Elizabeth, let, let, let's start with you. I've been talking to a lot of people in the environmental justice movement and others, and, and there's a lot of debate about carbon removal. Uh, there's a lot of fear that it enables um, the oil and gas industry, as you've kind of talked about. But there's also a wing of the of the movement that says, look, when you come down to it, this is a technology that is taking CO2 out of the air. And we want to take CO2 out of the air. And so that's just like basic, a good thing. Why not be behind that? Yeah, I, I really don't know anyone who is in the environmental justice movement who would say that. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, we use technology in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, we have been fighting for an industrial waterfront that builds for climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. We've, uh, we've operationalized community-owned solar. We're bringing offshore wind uh, to South Brooklyn. Um, so we're looking at, uh, at, at solutions at different scales uh, that reduce the emissions. We're working to take down pico plants and, and replace them with battery storage. So we're not anti-technology um, and we're not anti-looking at solutions that are radically different than the things that, that are familiar to us. But what we are against is uh, extraction. And we are, and, and we also know that um, carbon capture and sequestration and, and what is becoming really popular in New York, this, this, this so-called green hydrogen, uh, these are not solutions that are going to benefit frontline communities. Um, there is no conversation with frontline communities. I don't know who, uh, the, I don't know when these scientists get together uh, in rooms with each other uh, without people who look like us or come from our neighborhoods to talk about how we can solve these problems collectively when if there's going to be a disparate impact and has been in frontline communities all over the United States. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I, you know, to characterize us as being anti-technology is, is wrong. 
Um, and it's not unusual for us to be put in a box because we can always push that box aside. Uh, but the truth is that by 2042, we become the majority in this country and its frontline communities that are being impacted by extreme weather events. And we are thinking and moving it, not only moving legislation like we did with the CLCPR in the, in the state of New York, um, but we're also operationalizing what we call a just transition. So, so we're solution oriented. And I know I've said that a few times because I think that um, the way that uh, Julia was characterizing me uh, was a, some, someone who's sort of a fringe person who's not thinking about what needs to be done in the middle of crisis. No one cares more about what happens uh, to a community than the people who come from it. Uh, it's not possible for people who are in the ivory towers to care more and be more committed to the survival of the people than the people themselves. We do look at all of these recommendations when they put before us and we and we develop frameworks and responses to what we think is going to happen to our communities, regardless of whether or not we're invited into those rooms. Julia, one of the things that, you know, comes up all the time in a conversation about carbon removal is, you know, this is, a, this is something that is, as Elizabeth has pointed out, supported by the oil and gas company. I mean, uh, the CEO of Occidental Petroleum not long ago said she wants to turn Occidental into the Tesla of direct air capture. I mean, you know, they see this as the oil companies obviously see this as a way to continue pumping and burning fossil fuels as a way of, of um, you know, drawing out the transition. I mean, isn't that a problem? A couple of things. Let me get to that answer in a second. Let me start by saying that uh, I actually agree with almost everything Elizabeth said. Almost everything. There's two things I disagree with. One of them is how she says I characterize her. I just challenged her numbers. I didn't call her fringe or anything like it. Um, and I also disagree with the idea that something like green hydrogen couldn't help her community. Uh, it certainly could. And specifically, if it uh, did things like replace the diesel fumes from buses or heavy trucks, if it was used to support a clean port, things, we can electrify cars, but it's a lot harder to electrify long haul trucks. And that's a place where something like green hydrogen could actually take advantage of some of the offshore wind power she's talking about, put it to good work in her community. But with respect to the oil companies, I, there's a couple of questions that I just want to ask straight up. First of all, what do you want these guys to do? Apart from die and go away, like what do you want them to do? <laughs> I can't think of a more proactive stance than Vicky's. She has said in 20 years, Vicky green. Holub, the CEO of Occidental Petroleum, I can't think of a more proactive stance than saying in 20 years, we don't want to be a fossil fuel company. We want to be a CO2 removal company. Like that is that is the farthest imaginable departure from business as usual no, they're, as I they're can actually, think of. There actually are better ones. I can think of well, Ecuador so, in well, Brooklyn and, 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 and a company that uh, has a history of being engaged in, in fossil fuel extraction with a close relationship with BP that is looking at offshore wind. And is looking at how okay, they can move so away from the fossil fuel company. That's not a different one. That is an, but, but that you're, is an you're talking about something different. There's nothing. We're yep. talking about offshore wind versus um, <laughs> versus these big oil bailouts. You know, okay, so whoa, 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 whoa. You really are mixing a bunch of stuff together here. First of all, I, I would uh, ask. I, I would ask. I would ask that you that you not talk to me that way. You just said a whole bunch of things that. Uh, I, again, directionally, part of it I agree with, but part of it I simply can't. Uh, certainly, we've seen companies like Shell and Equinor and BP get into the offshore wind business, and they think of that as a part of the business. That will not be the totality of their business. It can't be. I'm using offshore wind as an example mm -hmm. on how a company can pivot from fossil fuel extraction to renewable energy, that it is possible. And it doesn't have to be based on carbon capture or sequestration or green hydrogen or anything else that's extracted. It is possible to make money and to pivot away from extractive an extractive economy to a renewable economy. Yeah. And I used it as an example. Right. And it is not the totality of what we need. We have to build a motorcycle here. We have to build all the parts to build it. Saying that I like carburetors does not build a motorcycle. We need all the economy, 100% of it, to get to zero. And yes, those companies are taking their core skill sets and doing some good work, but actually pulling CO2 out of the air and ocean 
and returning it to the earth from where it came is a perfectly valid way to contribute to climate change. And you're saying that these unproven mechanisms, these fossil fuel backed unproven mechanisms are, are the solution. Is that what I'm hearing? I'm saying that you need 10 things to get the job done, and this is one of them. So Julio, I wanna ask you one thing that Elizabeth kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, which is, okay, so yeah, Occidental Petroleum wants to go do, be the Tesla of direct air capture, great. And ExxonMobil wants to do some of this stuff, and you know, Chevron and, and whoever, whoever, it's great, okay? But the numbers that I've seen are something like a, a billion dollars in subsidy for various kinds of carbon capture. Um, why are we spending a billion dollars of, of federal money on this? If they want to do it, they're, they've certainly, uh, you know, despite the price of oil last year, uh, not poor companies. Why should we, you and I and Elizabeth, be subsidizing them to do this? First of all, you say it's unproven and untested and it can't possibly scale. And then you say it's so big and ready to deploy, they don't need any subsidies. Like those things aren't, aren't the same thing. So let me point out that in 2009, with the Stimulus Act that came out of Congress then, the ARRA, American Reinvest and Recovery Act. We put $5 billion on the table for carbon capture. Only about a half of that got spent. So people say, so we wasted $5 billion. No, we spent $2.5 billion. We gave $16 billion for renewables. It's not a subject, this is not an either or. We must support and incent renewables for real. We need transmission lines, we need we need innovation, we need deployment. But like last year, the tax incentives for wind were $44 billion. And the amount of money that was spent on carbon capture was one one hundredth of that. So no, I don't think that this is a big industrial bailout. It is a tiny fraction of what we need and we need to scale hugely fast. Actually, it wasn't $5 billion, it was $10 billion last year when Congress passed its omnibus bill to keep the government open and functioning. Nearly $10 billion was appropriated for false solutions uh, like carbon capture and storage, uh, carbon capture utilization, sequestration, and so-called green hydrogen. Yeah, that's a bunch and, of things, and, and it's, though, right? And it's, and, it's, and it's concerning to us that the Biden administration intends to double down on, on these fossil fuel backed on proven mechanisms. So we're really concerned about what that means for uh, the legacy of environmental racism in our communities. And, and that's not something that you've raised at all. Like you talk about our communities as, a, as, a, as an afterthought. I think what um, is, um, is, is, is fueling this, no pun intended, is the interest, the economic interests of the f fossil fuel companies um, and what benefits them. And so the concern about tech fixes is, is often that you can make mistakes, like what happens in, um, in, in Yahoo County, in Yazoo County, where uh, there was a rupture um, in the pipe. You can have, um, you could short circuit things uh, when it means that a company is going to make a lot of money for it. Uh, but the people who suffer as a result of that are our communities. And so accountability, monitoring, impacts, the studies haven't even been done to talk about what that means for low-income communities and, and communities of color. And so to move quickly on techno fixes because they benefit the fossil fuel economy without spending the amount of money and uh, and resources to talk about what those impacts are going to be for frontline communities uh, is, is fundamentally unfair and and i would just and i would also say racist because we're talking about a disparate impact on the people who are not responsible for creating climate change so um it really is that the, it's been front fronted the, the the resources for for these businesses uh have been made available so that they can actually continue to operate in a system that has gotten us where we are to begin with these are the same companies responsible uh, for so many of the problems that have happened all over the country and to trust that they're going to do something uh, that actually benefits us um, is, is, is really highly questionable. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm going to move to the last section now, which is about the winners and losers in this with this technology, if, if, to the degree it gets deployed and, and used. And, and Elizabeth, I, want, I, I think I'll start with you on this one. To connect with a little bit with what you've been saying, I mean, I've spent a lot of time reporting around the fossil fuel industry in in communities who live around power plants. I understand very well the risks that that people who live around them suffer. Um, but it, isn't it also true that every ton of CO2 that's in the atmosphere, 
wherever it comes from, increases the risk to communities all, all over, you know, to marginal communities in the developing world everywhere in, 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 on the globe. And so can't you make the argument that every ton of CO2 that is taken out of the atmosphere or that is not put into the atmosphere reduces those risks? And so in some way, this is, is helpful to, to marginal communities. Well, we have to reduce carbon and we have to reduce co-pollutants. The climate solution can't become an environmental justice problem. I can give you an example of, uh, you know, when Equinor said they were going to bring their ships uh, to assemble the parts in Brooklyn for offshore wind, we immediately thought that those ships would drop tons of knocks and socks in the lungs of our people. And so the, the, the vehicle is going to operate by, um, by electricity. Um, when it gets to the Verrazano. So, so yeah, those things are of concern for the global south. Uh, but I think there's also consistency in the messaging coming from the global south where we're talking about the Americas or we're talking about um, the continent of, of Mother Africa where people are saying that false solutions are not going to work for them uh, and that these are considered techno fixes. And I know that that language is triggering to Julio, but still um, there isn't enough uh, there for us to understand uh, how this won't have a disparate impact on the communities that it's supposedly intended to benefit. So Julio, I wanna ask you a, a question about connected to this, which is, I think there's a lot of confusion about out there about what the real risks are of, of carbon removal. I mean, and so I wanna ask you about the larger risks of burying and sequestering CO2, but also I want to make clear that CO2 is not a health risk in, it, in itself in the way that particulate matter is that comes out of cold plants. Elizabeth, you mentioned socks and knocks. It, it's not something that gets in your lungs and causes you know, heart disease or something like that. CO2 in itself, the reason we're talking about it, of course, is it's the pollutant that is driving the climate crisis, but it is not in itself a health impact to people who live around coal plants or around these industrial facilities. Right, so our, our bodies make CO2, we put it in beer. I mean, it right. is it is right. a different it's kind of thing. The in, bubbles in, in carbonated soda, right? I mean, right. obviously. But, but tell me about the risks of this technology to the degree that there are, mm -hmm. what, what are the risks to us, to people who live around these facilities and, and larger right. to our society? So let me break this into two pieces because we've, we've got lots of, different threads here. Let's talk first about redu reducing carbon at a carbon capture plant. And then let's talk about removing carbon from the air and oceans. If you capture carbon at an industrial facility or a power plant, when you do that, you also reduce socks, knocks, and particulates locally. So the implementation of carbon capture tech actually cleans frontline communities. It's part of the reason why the labor unions where those communities live have backed it so strongly. There is so much division so, between SEIU and 32BJ uh, and unions that are completely in opposition because all they think about is jobs and they don't think about their rank and file. Yes, well, um, but I think know, it would still, be really the, useful. I, who they would sorry. be useful if you could speak to the underground storage risks like leakage. Uh, I will blowouts, get to that. Earthquakes, groundwater contamination. If you will please allow awesome. me, I'm sure. Go, I am getting to that. First, though, I want to talk about the removal piece because removal is potentially a great development engine for the global south. In fact, places like Chile, South Africa, Chad, Ethiopia, uh, the Kerguelen Islands, Rajasthan and India are extraordinarily good places to site these facilities and get paid by the global north to pull CO2 out of the air and oceans. That's actually the position of Olufemi Taiwo, a political science professor at Georgetown, and, and when he looks at carbon removal, he thinks the global north should pay the global south to do it. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable proposition. With respect to the CO2 storage, most people don't know that we've been injecting CO2 underground for 50 years. So the number of incidents has been zero. Right, but what are zero. the risks? There, well, there are always risks whenever we do anything. In the case of storage, the risks are really, really tiny. And they really boil down to the wells. Does a well fail? Right. The groundwater contamination risk is effectively zero because oh. CO2 never exits. There, the, but most of the risks, and I think this is fair from Elizabeth's standpoint, are actually the surface risks. They're things like pipelines, 
and, and facilities and so forth that are there. I, I will say that the example she, she, she keeps citing from Mississippi, people were evacuated because of hydrogen sulfide in the line, not because of CO2 in the line, because hydrogen sulfide is incredibly deadly. There would not be hydrogen sulfide in these. And in fact, uh, we have studied this problem for 20 years and shown that the 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines that exist in our country today have been operated by PHMSA and regulated just did, I did say without, without incident. Julio, I did say hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, I, um, I know, but you but you throw them together fast, and I want to clarify. Well, that you throw audience. a lot together fast. I mean, what you just described about the global south sounded like green colonialism to me. The fact that the very people responsible for the conditions that exist in the global south are the ones that are going to benefit financially from from basically engaging in sequestration uh, is 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 just well, it, what it would you have much, them do? Pretty much blew my mind. It pretty much blew my mind. It would be great if they can just engage in reparations and giving them funding so that they can green up their territories, reclaim their water systems like, like the River Niger, which has been polluted for so many years by U.S. companies, uh, and people have had to die because the groundswell is polluted, the water is toxic, and people have gotten sick. It would be great if they actually engaged in giving them the resources that they need so that they can actually reclaim their lands and their ecosystems um, instead so of benefiting financially financially from the extraction that got them okay. in that position in the so first place. Strongly disagree with a couple of things you just said there. But first and foremost, I want to go back to Jeff's question about winners and losers. Everyone loses if we don't get to zero. Period. Global North, Global South, frontline communities, worst of all, actually. And we got to get to zero. But, but I want to be clear, what I was talking about is not eco-colonialism in the sense that you raised I've called it. I've, I've I called it green it, colonialism. I've, I've, I have written against eco-colonialism and green colonialism actively, like so. That's not what I'm proposing. But instead, you know, you could actually pay people in Ethiopia to pull CO2 out of the air and oceans. It's the opposite of extraction. It's not to make EOR. It's to get paid to clean the environment. And that would create wealth and energy and infrastructure that would serve that nation and those people, especially at the edge where desert desertification is destroying crops and these people don't have a lot of revenue, providing a pathway of revenue into those communities, I think would be very salutary. So Julio, I wanna ask you about something, David Keith, Harvard uh, engineering mm -hmm. professor and advocate. We were talking about solar geoengineering, which is the idea of putting particles in the stratosphere and, and and we were talking about the risks of that. And, and he said something really, really interesting to me, which is that he thinks that the environmental risks of building out the you know, air capture infrastructure are actually greater than the risks of solar geoengineering. And that he thought that a lot of environmental advocates are going to regret their embrace of uh, carbon removal once they get a sense of this sort of scale of environmental impact building all these machines essentially are going to have. What do you think of that? Well, some environmental advocates are already having regrets about the scale of cobalt mining because of the scale up of battery systems, right? Like, like, like when we scale any solution, there's stuff we find that is problematic. And I don't want to be, and that's not a dodge. It's quite the opposite. We got to be clear eyed about the fact that all of our solution sets have real challenges and problems. And if we're not sensitive to the impacts, then we're going to end up in the wrong place. I think that we can't take anything off the table because we're in real trouble. I think we should absolutely do research on solar radiation management, despite all of the questions and concerns. But we can't answer questions and concerns until we learn something. As we scale up CO2 removal, we're going to see the same thing. We've already seen that with trees. We tried planting a whole bunch of trees. A whole bunch of stuff failed. Great. We learned something. Now we can do a better job reforesting the world. We're learning the same thing with soils. We just got some new science that came out that said soil carbon is a lot less than we thought it was. Well, okay, well, if that's the case, then, then maybe we need to learn a little bit more. We have to be generous with each other in this exchange. We have to be giving and generous because otherwise we just throw rocks at each other and greenhouse gases still keep rising. We're not even remotely on track for net zero right now. Like greenhouse gases are rising already again this year. They're going to rise again next year. They're going to rise again the year after. 
And mm. the arithmetic is what drives me to my position. I don't see how we get to zero without doing the CO2 removal. Elizabeth? Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, the idea of being kind and generous uh, with Exxon Mobil and ConocoPhillips and BP um, is, is, uh, is, is really an interesting way of framing something, uh, considering the role that they have played um, in the extraction and, and, uh, and literally just killing people in our communities. I live in an EJ community. I lost four relatives to COVID. I had COVID. I have lived in an EJ community my whole life. I know personally what it's like to be surrounded by, uh, by power plants and waste transfer stations and what that does. Um, and so I will never get those people or that, that my, my health back. Um, so to be generous uh, means that at least uh, there needs to be uh, leveling the playing field, there needs to be equity, there needs to be a centering of racial justice, and, and our communities need to be at the table. And the idea that a bunch of, uh, of the elite are discussing what the solution should be when they benefit them economically um, without us at the table is, is, is just contrary to everything that people are talking about all over the United States. People are talking about a different kind of governance, a different kind of decision making. And this is not that. This is old school capitalism uh, with big corporations looking to line their pockets at the expense of our communities uh, and using technology and using the fear of climate change as a way of, of moving their agenda. Um, I agree that we need to try everything, but everything can't happen at the expense of our community. Well, I think Elizabeth makes a great point there in the sense that, um, well, many things, but one of them is is the idea that, you know, there's a tremendous amount of distrust of ExxonMobil, for example, Chevron, I mean, and deservedly so. As you know, as well as anyone, you know, they miss Inter they, they deliberately misrepresented the science, their political lobbying has stalled mm -hmm. our response to climate change for decades. And so why should we trust anything that they're involved in? I mean, why should we, when we hear the head of Occidental Petroleum say we want to be the Tesla of direct air capture, why should we not just say, yeah, right, uh-huh, well, prove it to me because, you know, I don't trust anything you say. I think that it's exactly the kind of framing that you just laid out in point of fact. First of all, there's ample grounds to not trust them. Being generous is not the same thing as being trustworthy, uh, and they have to earn those stripes. This comes back to the second thing. As far as all of this on climate anything, anywhere, for anybody, I'm from Missouri, show me. That's it. So in the case of Exxon, they hurriedly and sketchily announced a carbon management business unit. It looked like it was written on the back of a napkin and announced like three days later, after all of their competitors had already done that two years earlier, right? Um, you have a company like uh, Occidental that's putting money into innovative solutions and is paying for cleanup and removal. Same sort of thing that Equinor is doing. Compare that with, say, a company like ConocoPhillips or Aramco that isn't exactly doing those things, right? So it's not one thing. In the same way that in the power sector, there's utilities that people really like and appreciate, and there's utilities that are scoundrels. And you do it based on what their walk is, what they do, where the money goes, what it yields, what's the metric. And the metric these days should be tons as much as anything else. What's the real tons of reduction and abatement? If you make a 2050 commitment, what's your 2025 commitment? It's not good enough to have something far off in the future. What are you doing in five years? What are you doing in 10 years? Those are good ways to start grading these people on their level of seriousness and commitment. I want to end this section now, and I want to do just a few quick questions that are on slightly different or broader topics. And I, I want you to just give me a kind of brief answer to, to each of them and, and uh, you know, a couple sentences, a minute or so. What's the biggest media generated myth about the climate crisis? That we're doing anything. What we're doing now is not yet material. Elizabeth, what's the biggest media generated myth about the climate crisis? I think the biggest myth is that uh, the climate crisis affects everyone in the same way uh, when it actually affects frontline communities most, the people who are least responsible for creating climate change. Joe Biden's infrastructure plan was released. Mm -hmm. 
give it a grade from A to F and explain why that you're giving it that grade. Well, I would give it an A grade, but realizing that it's only the first, it's only the first assignment in the semester. It, we, we need another 10 just like it afterwards, or else we're, we're just going to fail. This is, this is the opening ante. It's a really good one. I give it strong marks, but it is still just the first step. I think I would have to give it a B. Um, I, you know, we were sorry to learn that it intends to double down on these fossil fuel backed on proven mechanisms. It's that's troubling to us. And we see it as nothing more than the big oil bailouts at the expense of environmental justice communities that bear the brunt of disproportionate legacy pollution. So I, I would give it a B. Talking about the climate crisis is about talking about risk, about various kinds of risks. When, we, when you think about the subject we've been talking about today, carbon removal, what do you see as the sort of single greatest risk to pursuing this technology? First of all, I don't think it's about risk. I think it's about time. We're on the clock. We have to go super far, super fast and all together. And so it's not about tons even, which is the thing I like to talk about. It's not about risk, it's about time. Because we already know enough to know that climate change is terrible, it's man-made and it's gonna get worse. And that every ton we put in the atmosphere stays there for a long time, we all know that. So really the question is not what should we do, the question is what can we do? How quickly can we marshal solutions across the board of every kind? How quickly can we get them out there and what does it really take? These technologies are man-made, um, which means that there's risk um, because there are always going to be mistakes and um, and I think that, you know, we talked, I talked a little bit about um, leakage, blowouts, earthquakes, groundwater contamination. Um, I think that, um, that those are the risks uh, and how those things are going to impact uh, frontline communities. There is an enormous amount of risk involved and I don't think enough uh, time or resources has been allocated. Also, whenever people move fast um, and when there's expediency, it's always done at the expense of frontline communities. Uh, it's almost like the objective, which is basically um, it, you know, getting, getting more, more money for these companies is more important than the impact on communities like ours. Thank you both. This has been very, very interesting. I'm very grateful to you both for sharing your views about this. Uh, it's certainly something that we're going to continue talking about for um, a long time, I think. So um, thank you very much.